Okay, cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kaishun Wang, and uh, welcome to uh, Instacart's uh, Research Speaker Series. Uh, this is our second event. Not sure uh, how many of you joined our first event, uh, which uh, featured Stanford professor Haru Kishner. Uh, we also have a few more speakers uh, lined up already for 2021. Uh, so today, uh, it's my great pleasure, pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Yongfen Zhang from Rogers University. Uh, Professor Zhang is well known in the domain of recommendation systems, uh, we, where he uses uh, machine learning and economics theory uh, to build ex explainable recommenders. Uh, today, he will talk about explainable uh, human-centered AI uh, with applications in e-commerce. Uh, so we'll have a uh, Q&A at the end of the presentation, uh, but you are welcome to submit your questions in the Zoom chat anytime during the presentation. Uh, so now without uh, any further ado, uh, please join me and welcome Professor Yongfen Zhang. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, um, Haishin, for the introduction. And uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce our work on explainable human-centered AI uh, with applications in e-commerce and the recommender systems in, in, in this talk. So um, um, I'm gonna start with a very broad picture that AI helps in many uh, human-centered tasks in particular, for example, uh, these applications, recommendation systems, search engines, uh, QA systems that we use nearly every day and uh, some other, what do we call as high stake applications like uh, health, uh, clinical support systems, legal systems, and uh, uh, conversational systems. So um, um, the explainability in human-centered AI systems are extremely important because usually we uh, not only want to know that a model really works, for example, it makes accurate predictions, but also we want to know why it works, which means that why the model makes uh, this particular uh, decision. And this help uh, to increase the trustworthiness of the uh, systems. And this is actually explainability perspective is, is, is even more important in um, high stake applications that are related to health, safety, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, sorry, legal systems and the law systems. For example, in healthcare, um, self-driving and uh, legal assistance because the um, errors and the bias in these systems may cause severe losses in life, money, and uh, people's reputation. So overall, explainable AI can help uh, human beings to make uh, uh, better decisions, especially, for example, in e-commerce systems that we're going to uh, focus a lot in today's talk. So um, in general, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, three broad topics in explainable uh, human-centered AI. The first one is neurosymbolic and the neurologic reasoning for uh, explainable AI. Uh, and we're going to use the technique to solve logical equations and uh, make explainable recommendations. Then we're going to talk about uh, knowledge graph reasoning uh, for, for example, search recommendation and the dialogue systems. And we're going to briefly uh, tackle the relationship between fairness and uh, explainability in these systems because these two perspectives are very fundamental to ethical AI uh, research and responsible AI research. And eventually we're going to talk about uh, natural language, how do we generate natural language explanations in uh, recommendation systems for, uh, for users. So I would like to begin with this uh, uh, very broad picture to show the scope of AI. The reason is that recently, um, Deep learning is machine learning and especially deep learning are very uh, popular, very successful. Uh, so that uh, maybe many people think that deep, I mean, uh, machine learning is equal to AI, but actually uh, AI does not equal to machine learning. E AI includes machine learning. So except for machine learning, there are also some other methods for um, AI, for example, planning, reasoning, search, and uh, knowledge representation. So here is a very, um, a uh, rough, broad history of AI research, which can be broadly classified into two uh, uh, broad scopes. The first one is symbolic reasoning approach to AI, which was prospering beginning from the mid 1950s to late 1980s. So this type of AI is also called the uh, GoFi, which is good old fashioned AI. So another type of AI, which we are probably more familiar with is machine learning approach to AI 
which was pr prospering from early 1990s to date with the uh, successful applications of deep learning. So I believe that uh, uh, <clears throat> you are familiar with these names, like for example, symbolic reasoning approaches. We have A star search, knowledge representation of reasoning, production rules, and alpha beta pruning. So they are uh, they have found their application in expert systems and uh, for example, IBM Deep Blue for uh, chess AI. So for uh, machine learning approaches to AI, of course, these names are uh, uh, frequently used. Support vector machines, matrix factorization, representation, representation learning, and uh, deep neural networks, and they have been applied in recommended systems and a lot of uh, image and language processing uh, systems. So the reason I mentioned these two approaches to AI is that uh, we hope to uh, find the advantages and the disadvantages of these two approaches, so that it can help us to build a better explainable AI systems. <clears throat> the symbolic approach to AI practice this kind of uh, um, top-down design approach where we have data and we have some rules. These rules could be manually designed and we do symbolic reasoning using these rules to derive answers. So the machine learning approach uh, practice another bottom-up design approach. For example, in supervised learning, right? We have data and we have answers which are the labels to the data. So we do machine learning to learn a model over the uh, data and answers so that we can have uh, the output rules, uh, which is our model. And we're going to use this model to make predictions. So the advantage of uh, the uh, symbolic approach is that usually they can make uh, highly accurate decisions, but the recall of the decision is really low. Um, and uh, another advantage that the uh, results are usually highly explainable and human readable. But the disadvantage is that uh, it requires expert, extensive human experts, and uh, it's really difficult to handle noisy data. For the machine learning approach, the advantage is that it requires less human efforts, <clears throat> and uh, it, it works better at, with noisy data. But the disadvantage, of course, is what we are uh, trying to talk about in this talk, which is that uh, the decisions are really difficult to uh, explain, which, because they use uh, mostly uh, black box models. So now we naturally want to answer this question. Can we um, reach the best of the two worlds? So um, this is uh, usually called the neurosymbolic machine learning. So based on, by, by bridging these two uh, methods, we want to improve both the accuracy and the decision transparency of the uh, uh, AI systems. But the key challenge is that uh, the symbolic approach usually works in the discrete symbolic reasoning space, but the uh, machine learning approach usually works in a differentiable continuous space. So the challenge here is that how do we bridge these two? Um, uh, one is discrete, but another is uh, continuous. These two different spaces for uh, neurosymbolic machine learning and for explainable AI and for applications in recommendation systems and e-commerce. So uh, to answer this question, uh, we first uh, take a look at this uh, SAT problem, which is the uh, propositional satis satisfiability problem. I believe that uh, this is a very fundamental problem to uh, computer scientists, which asks that given this logical equation, how can we decide if there exists uh, some appropriate assignments to the true false values to ABC variables here so that the equation can, can, can hold? Okay. For example, in this, in this, we know that if A is false, B is true, and C is true, then the result will be true, right? So this is the first problem proven to be an NP complete. An extension to this problem is uh, solving logical equations, which means that given, for example, a set of logical equations like this, can we solve the variables? What is the value of ABC? For what is the true false value for ABC? Okay, and then uh, can we predict the uh, true false value for new equations? Right? This is the uh, logical equation uh, problem, which is also an NP complete problem. So the reason we start with this uh, uh, problem is that the logical expressions are highly transparent, right? Because we know that if this is true, we know that re the reason is that A is false and the B, C are true, right? So they would have some, possess some intuitive meanings in many uh, applications like uh, uh, recommendation systems. And uh, many applications can be formulated as a logical reasoning uh, problem, which helps to enhance the explainability in, in many systems. So now we try to 
answer this question. Can we use machine learning to solve the logical equations? And then can we predict the uh, true false value of neurological equations? <clears throat> so uh, to solve the problem, we can we propose this, uh, what we call as neurologic uh, reasoning architecture. The key idea is to uh, learn the logical variables as vectors in the logical embedding space <clears throat> and learn the logical operations for example, and, or, and not as logical modules in the latent space. So that uh, two vectors uh, being processed by the end, so the output vector would be the end embedding for the input um, vectors, similar for the or and uh, not operation. So um, in this way, for more complicated logical equations, we can dynamically assemble uh, a neuro neural structure according to the structure of the logical equation, for example, for a VI and a VG or not VK, right? We can, we can first calculate VI and the VG, then not VK, and then we can calculate the OR between these two parts to get the final result, the final embedding of the whole logical ex expression. Then we can compare this vector embedding and a constant uh, true vector embedding to decide if this um, that if this equation would be true or uh, false. And uh, this is uh, a flexible framework because we can use some uh, any task dependent loss to optimize the architecture, including the uh, variable embeddings and the uh, uh, neural modules in these uh, architectures. For example, for classification, uh, we can use cross entropy for uh, recommendation and search in e-commerce, we can use Paris ranking loss, uh, something like this. Right? So you may ask that, uh, how do we know the end module is really doing the logical end, right? So because in, the, in, the, in, the, in this page, it just, it's just a neural module, a network. So how do we guarantee that it is really doing logical end? So how do we also for the or and the not operations? So to solve the problem, we introduce uh, logical regularization, which means that for example, for the not module, right, we need to guarantee that the not module satisfies some basic properties. For example, double negation property, which means that for, for a variable W, if we apply not for twice over W, then the result should return to W itself. So this can be represented as a regularizer to guarantee that this property is satisfied. And we can uh, similarly design uh, properties regularizers for uh, and and uh, or modules. And these are going to serve as the logical regularization part uh, to guarantee the logical operations are, um, um, are satisfied. So here is the final model. Okay, we have a set of input logical uh, equations and we build the model, then we solve for the variables and then we can use the variables to, um, to, to decide the uh, true false value for new uh, logical equations. So then I'm going to uh, introduce uh, two applications of this architecture. One is uh, solving logical equations and the second is explainable recommendation systems in e-commerce. For solving logical uh, equations, uh, for example, we can show that uh, uh, our architecture can, uh, can uh, for, uh, the problem is that we have the training logical equations and we try to predict the true false value of new equations so that we can get uh, about 95 or 96 the percentage of accuracy uh, for predicting the true false value of uh, neurological equations. And we can also use the architecture to solve the uh, true false value of the variables. So this figure shows uh, the, tr the, 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 var the variable embedding, how the variable embedding changes during the optimization learning of this uh, uh, architecture initially the variables are randomly initialized. So it's like a Gaussian architecture. So later, after optimization, they are separated into two parts. One part is the true variable. The other part is the, um, um, uh, represents the false variables. So the accuracy of uh, variable solving is about 96 percentage, which is, uh, 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 which shows that we can use machine learning to uh, approximately solve uh, NP complete problems. So the second application is a more uh, practical application, explainable recommendation systems. The reason that we introduce explainable recommendation system is that it is a very representative uh, human-centered AI task because it naturally involves human in the loop because basically in recommender, recommender systems, <clears throat> in recommender, recommender systems, 
humans are going to provide the data uh, for recommended systems by, for example, uh, purchasing products, uh, watching movies in, uh, in, the, in the systems. And then the recommended system use this data to learn the model and further predict and recommend, uh, provide the recommendations for the users. And they, and the, and they have been uh, applied in a wider scope of applications, including, for example, uh, e-commerce, social networks, search engines, right? a, lot, a lot of applications. And they are even um, um, used in some high stake applications, for example, in financial services, uh, legal services, and uh, medical services. So because of this, explanation is extremely important for recommended systems because the system is eventually making decisions or making suggestions for humans, right? So humans naturally want to know why this suggestion or decision is made for me because knowing the why could help, could help the humans to make more informed uh, decisions. And it helps to improve the transparency, trustworthiness and uh, uh, reliability of uh, these uh, uh, human-centered AI systems. So um, how do we apply uh, neurologic reasoning for uh, explainable recommendation? <clears throat> so actually logical expressions help to model the atom relationships in recommendation systems. So in many uh, uh, e-commerce recommendation systems, we know that some the products have a lot of uh, important relationships. For example, some products are complementary with each other. Some products are substitutive with each other. And uh, of course, uh, a, lot of other, a lot of other products are irrelevant from each other. So all of these re relationships can be represented by um, logical expressions. For example, for complementary um, uh, products, we can represent it in this way. For example, iPhone and a iPhone case, if we do and, then the result would be true, which means that uh, only if these two products are true, then the result is true, which means that these two products are usually co-purchased with, with each other. So for substitutive products, for example, uh, Coke and the Pepsi, usually if a consumer purchase Coke, then the consumer would, will not purchase Pepsi. And uh, if the consumer purchase Pepsi, then usually the consumer would not, will not pr purchase Coke because fundamentally these two products are substitutive. And this can be represented by this kind of uh, this kind of logical expression, which means that if Coke is true, then Pepsi should be false, or that if Pepsi is true, then Coke should be false. Okay. And for irrelevant products, for example, iPhone and a Android data line, then if we do and, the result should be uh, false. So. Um, um, a good thing is that the user interaction histories can be uh, represented as this kind of uh, logical expressions uh, very easily, right? <clears throat> For example, if we know that a user has purchased some atoms and we know that some of them are, uh, some of them are positive, which means which the user likes the product, some of, them, some of them are negative, which means the user dislikes the product, then we can assign the values as true or false. And then we can um, represent the user's uh, uh, purchase history as a logical expression. And then we can use Perez ranking loss to, uh, to solve the problem and to rank the products for the users. <clears throat> so here are some uh, uh, experiments in, in a e-commerce recommender, uh, sorry, in, 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 in for movie recommendation and uh, uh, e-commerce recommendation. And we can see that we can uh, improve the recommendation accuracy. But most importantly, right, we can provide explanations for users. For example, we can use the AND module to extract these complementary atom explanations. Okay, we can, we can see that we recommend this iPhone case. The reason we recommend this iPhone case is because that you have purchased the iPhone and uh, we believe that uh, these two products are complementary with each other. Uh, that's the reason that we recommend uh, this, uh, this iPhone case for you. Right? So in this way, we can improve the transparency and the uh, explainability of uh, the recommended systems. So uh, this is a logical reason approach to uh, explainable human-centered AI. And uh, another thing that uh, uh, I'd like to introduce is uh, the knowledge graph reasoning approach for uh, explainable AI. <clears throat> So knowledge graph is a very uh, valuable resource to, uh, to make recommendations and provide explainable uh, decisions because we can, uh, a lot of information, useful uh, information can be structured as a graph, right? And we can do graph reasoning to make decisions for the users. And most importantly, 
the path, the resonant path in the graphs usually can, satisfy, can serve as a very natural explanation for users. For example, in this case, if we recommend the user A with an atom A, right, then we have two uh, paths. And we can tell the user that the reason we recommend this atom is because you have purchased this atom B before and another user who purchased the atom B also purchased the atom A and that's why we recommend this atom, right? So for this pass, we can explain it as, okay, we, uh, we have found that you have uh, commented on this particular feature before. For example, the feature could be the price, the color, the, um, um, uh, for example, the uh, taste of some product, right? And this product uh, performs very well on that feature. So that's why we, rec we recommend this particular uh, product. <clears throat> so uh, we can use reinforcement reasoning over knowledge graphs to make uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, explainable recommendations. I'm not going to, uh, to talk about too much details. I'm just going to talk about the, the, the high level idea of uh, how do we do reinforcement reasoning over uh, knowledge graphs. Basically, we would like to train a, uh, a reinforcement agent so that we hope that uh, the agent starts past explanation, past exploration starting from a particular user. And we hope that the agent can, uh, can uh, trace over this pass and then the, uh, the agent can end up at a good product for the user with very high probability, okay? So in this way, the uh, action space is defined as the nodes in this graph, okay? And then the reward is defined as if or not a particular uh, node is a good node for the user. And this is uh, application specific, for example, in recommendation e-commerce recommendation systems. If uh, this is a product that the user has purchased before and the user like this product, then we're going to give a very uh, high reward uh, Otherwise, for example, if the user purchased this product but uh, rated a very negative rating on this product, then we're going to give a very uh, uh, negative reward uh, for the uh, reinforced learning agent. So by doing so, we can train an agent eventually, and then we can apply the agent to make predictions. For example, beginning from a new user, the agent is going to do past reasoning in this uh, knowledge graph. and. Uh, make some uh, uh, recommendations, recommended products uh, for the user. And this reasoning pass will naturally serve as the explanation for the decision of the uh, agent. So here are some intuitive examples to show how do we make decisions and uh, provide explanations. <clears throat> uh, so this figure shows that we can improve the uh, uh, decision accuracy, which is the recommendation accuracy in e-commerce systems. <clears throat> and then, here are some examples about uh, the um, uh, extracted explanations, past-based explanations for the users. Right? For example, for the first, uh, we can explain it as the reason we recommend this uh, iPhone case is because you have purchased the iPhone, and uh, this product is off also uh, is off is frequently co-viewed with this charger land product, and the iPhone case is uh, frequently co-purchased with this product. But the second explanation, it can be um, said as, <clears throat> for, for example, you have purchased the shampoo before and you have used these two words to describe this shampoo, right? And another product, our recommended product is also frequently described by these two words. And that's why we recommend this uh, conditioner uh, for you. So one extension about uh, this uh, uh, framework is to explainable conversational AI, right? For example, <clears throat> because a lot of uh, recommendation services are provided by uh, this kind of uh, voice-based uh, conversational AI systems recently, for example, in Siri, uh, Amazon Alexa, and Apple HomePod. So explanation is even more important in this kind of conversational AI systems because Usually in these voice-based channels, we can only provide one single recommendation to the user because it will be very boring to read out uh, 10 recommendations for the user, right? It's very different from uh, um, uh, web-based recommendation systems. So because you, we can only provide one single recommendation to the user, then it's very, it's, it, it will be very, very, very good if we can explain to the user why we are recommending this particular one so that we can improve the uh, experience of the users and uh, make the conversation more 
natural and more fluently. So by doing so, we can, to achieve this goal, we can do, uh, for example, uh, transparent uh, dialogue state tracking over knowledge graphs for uh, explainable conversation. So the basic idea is that we can expand the tracing paths over the knowledge graph during the process of the uh, conversation. And at each stage, right? for example, at this stage, if the user asks me, asks the system, for example, why do you think that I, 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 I should pre prefer uh, Valina, right? Then we can use the knowledge graph to, uh, to answer this uh, why type question. So for example, we can see that uh, the reason um, uh, we, uh, we think that you would probably like this Valina uh, flavor product is because you have liked, you have purchased this, uh, uh, this is a chocolate bar, right? You have purchased this uh, kind of bar before and the flavor of that product was Valina. So that's why they think that you would probably um, uh, like Valina products uh, currently. So in this way, we can greatly increase the uh, trustworthiness of the system because the user knows that we are not um, uh, making the conversation randomly, right? We really knows uh, why this uh, uh, particular question is asked by the system or why this product is recommended by the system. So we can also uh, uh, try to enhance the fairness of the uh, uh, explanations. <clears throat> the reason that is that we have identified, we have thought, we have observed a very interesting, uh, we have made a very interesting observation in in e-commerce recommended systems, which is that uh, <clears throat> if we did, if we consider the top five percent users as active users, which which are the top five percent users who has purchased a lot of products. Uh, in the in the in the e-commerce system, and if we consider uh, these top of five percent users and active users, and the remaining ninety percent users as inactive users, okay, we can see that uh, the recommended system usually can provide a much better recommendation performance for the uh, very small scale five percent active users. For example, in the typical uh, uh, recommended system for the active users, right. Our NDCG could be 15%, uh, but for inactive users, which are the majority 95% users, the NDCG is only 6%, which is about half of the active users. So this means that uh, only a small percentage of users experience a very good uh, recommendation performance in e-commerce, but a large majority of other users are exper experiencing much worse uh, recommendation performance than these uh, top uh, five percent users. And because these uh, uh, 95 percent users are majority in quantity, right? So the overall performance is very low, right? Because the, uh, the, the, the good performance users only account for five percent users. So now it inspires, it, it, it inspires us, can we possibly uh, improve the recommendation experience for those inactive users? And the meanwhile, improve the overall performance of the recommended system because, <clears throat> because these inactive users are the majority, account for the majority part of the system. So to solve the problem, uh, we can, uh, we propose this kind of uh, fairness constraint uh, explainable uh, recommendation. Basically we can define this, uh, uh, for example, group level recommendation and fairness and the group level um, um, explanation uh, uh, diversity and fairness. The basic idea is just to, to calculate the average recommendation performance for these two uh, groups, 5% active user group and the 95% inactive user group. And then we try to guarantee that the difference between their recommendation performance would be uh, bounded by a uh, threshold. Right? So in this way, we find that uh, uh, we can, uh, usually we can only uh, slightly uh, decrease the recommendation performance of the active users but significantly increase the recommendation performance of the inactive users. And because the inactive users account for 95% of the system, then because of this, we can also significantly um, improve the overall recommendation performance of the system from, for example, uh, about the 7% NDCG to 8% ADC, NDCG. So, um, so this helps us to improve both the uh, uh, overall recommendation performance and the fairness and finally the uh, transparency of the recommended systems. So finally, um, uh, <clears throat> for the last part of the talk, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, 
how do we generate natural language explanations for uh, uh, human-centered uh, uh, AI systems? The reason is that we believe, uh, uh, we, we think that the reason that natural language sentence is uh, the most uh, human-friendly way of uh, uh, providing explanations. So we believe that the future machines should be able to explain themselves uh, by using natural languages and because this can greatly enhance better understanding the collaboration and the trust between humans and the machines because we believe that in the future, humans and the machines are going to work collaboratively to solve problems. And if we can uh, uh, use explanations to enhance the trust between these two parties, it can greatly uh, uh, improve their uh, uh, understanding between these two uh, parties. So um, actually uh, recommended system, explainable recommendation is a very uh, suitable task for developing natural language explanation models. The reason is that usually we have uh, very high quality ground truth explanations from humans in e-commerce systems. <clears throat> For example, when a user purchases some product, the user usually are going to write a review of the product. So some sentences in the review are actually the user's own explanations about uh, why I purchased this product, uh, why I like this product, or why I dislike this product. So by using this kind of uh, data, we can train a very good model to generate explanations, uh, recommendation explanations for, for our uh, new recommendations. So, uh, but the problem here is that explanation generation is very different from uh, traditional uh, free text generation by using, for example, uh, GPT or sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence models. The reason is that uh, explanation is uh, kind of uh, purpose the text generation because we want the explanation to the generated sentence to serve certain purposes, right? To explain to the user, the purpose is to explain to the user why something is recommended, why something is good, why something is bad for the for the user. <clears throat> so because of this, it requires more controllability of the uh, generation model. And this is also a controllability is also a very key challenge for current uh, uh, natural language generation models like uh, uh, GPT-3. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so now how do we define controllability in this uh, uh, explanation generation uh, problem, right? So we're going to define controllability in two, in two perspectives. One is that we want to control what a feature to discuss about in our explanation, right? The second one is that what would be the sentiment uh, of the generated sentences? <clears throat> For example, uh, in this is, is, this, is, this is an example about uh, um, hotel recommendation. For example, for a hotel, uh, there could be different features about the hotel. For example, what is the what about the bathroom of the of the hotel? What about the uh, shower uh, and the tub of this uh, uh, hotel? And what about the room of this uh, hotel? Right? And if the hotel is close to airport or something like that, so um, different users would be would be interested would care about the different different features, right? Even for the same product, so we would we would like to control what feature do we talk about in the explanation. The second one is that the sentiment, right? <clears throat> the sentiment means that if our system be, uh, if our system believes that uh, this uh, some product is a good recommendation for the user, then we hope that the sentiment of the explanation would be positive. And if our system believes that some product is a bad choice for the user, then we hope that the explanation, the sentiment of the generated explanation would be negative, right? So basically we hope that our recommended system should be honest, right? So if our system is going to recommend something for the user, then it is really going to talk about the good perspective, perspective, perspectives of the of the of the product, and if our system, our recommended system believes that something is bad for the user, then it should honestly talk about the bad perspectives of the product. So in this way, <clears throat> the system can really help the user to make uh, uh, the correct decision for the user, rather than just persuading the user to take some uh, uh, decisions. So um, uh, here is a model uh, to generate explanations, controllable explanations for users. Um, so basically it's a sequence to sequence model, right? Um, but uh, we have some key ingredients in this sequence to sequence model to achieve the aforementioned goals. One is that we're going to consider the user and the atom uh, 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 
embeddings in the generation model because we want the explanation to be personalized, right? For different users, the explanations should be different. And for different atoms, the explanation should also be different. And we also have this part, sentiment part, to control the sentiment of the generated symptoms. We also have the feature to control what a feature to talk about in the, uh, in the generated explanation. And the feature could be either uh, pre-selected according to the user's uh, previous uh, preferences or to be predicted by, some, by, by another uh, feature prediction model. Okay. So here is are some examples uh, generated by, uh, by this model, right? <clears throat> so we can see that uh, uh, the first three examples are, uh, sorry, sorry, the first two examples are uh, positive explanations and the, the, second, the last two examples are negative explanations. So first we can see that we can control what features to talk about, right? If we want the explanation to talk about the bathroom, then we can generate an explanation to talk about the bathroom, right? If we want to talk about the, 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 the rooms, then we can generate an explanation to talk about the rooms. So another thing is that we can control the sentiment, right? If uh, our predicted score is very high, right? For example, it's 3.9, then the, the sentiment of the explanation is, is quite a positive. But if our predicted score is uh, very low, then the generated sentence explanation would be negative. For example, it is not close to the airport. That's why we do not recommend this particular uh, uh, atom for you. So, so in this way, uh, by telling the user what to recommend and what to not recommend, it can greatly uh, increase the trust between the human and the recommended system because humans know that the system is not just, uh, I mean, uh, arbitrarily persuading, persuading me to buy something, but also helping us to make good decisions <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the recommended systems. Um, so um, finally, we can also do a vision language co-learning to provide uh, um, uh, 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 visual explanations for users. The reason is that in many systems like e-commerce systems, uh, we not only have the product information, but always we have, but usually we have the uh, image that it describes the particular product. Right? For example, this kind of uh, clothes product. And a good thing is that usually uh, we can do vision and a text uh, uh, alignment uh, in this kind of a context, which means that uh, usually when a user purchased a product, uh, the user are going to write a sentence uh, of review to uh, describe the product. And some features, some perspectives or words mentioned in the review are actually corresponding to some particular visual features of the product. For example, this user talks about the neck opening of the product, uh, which corresponds to this part. And another user talks about the pocket size of the product, which corresponds to uh, this part. Right? So in this way, we can develop a model to align, to do alignment between the text and the image to provide the visual explanations. Um, again, I'm not going to, uh, to, to dive too much uh, details about, to, about this architecture. Just uh, basically, we just, uh, uh, we can just uh, uh, split the image into some uh, 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 square uh, uh, regions, right? And then for each region, we can learn the uh, visual embedding. And then we can use this part, e e visual embedding as part of the input uh, to the previous uh, model to predict the uh, user's uh, uh, text explanation, uh, which is the text sentence review written by the user. Uh, in this system. So in this way, we can learn the attention mechanisms, uh, attention scores over the uh, image regions in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the product picture. And uh, we can further highlight the most significant uh, image regions as the visual explanations for the user. So here are some examples, right? <clears throat> so you can see that for these products, we can not only provide this kind of uh, uh, sentence explanations, but also we can highlight the part of the image that our sentence explanation is talking about uh, in, in these products <clears throat> so that the user knows not only uh, the sentence explanation, but also intuitively which part of the uh, sentence, which part of the image, which part of the product we're talking about in these explanations. But also there are some bad cases. Usually um, some features, for example, fabric, right? 
this feature is a global feature. It does not correspond to a particular region of the image. So uh, these features are difficult to uh, to to uh, uh, I mean to align in the image because it corresponds to the overall image instead of uh, instead of uh, some small particular regions of the image. So, okay, so um, as a summary, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, and we have been uh, talking about uh, explainable human-centered AI uh, in this uh, talk, and uh, we have used uh, search and the recommendation system and the dialogue system as examples to show uh, why uh, explanation is very important in this kind of human-centered AI, and how do we generate explanations for these systems, including like logical based explanations, uh, knowledge graph based explanations, and uh, uh, natural language explanations, and finally visual explanations uh, for the users. And it can help to inc increase the uh, transparency <clears throat> of the systems. And, uh, uh, and again, we believe that in the future, uh, uh, we should make uh, uh, the, the, the machines be able to explain themselves for example, using using natural languages, and this can greatly help to increase the trust between the human and the AI uh, in the future intelligent systems. So, okay, thank you, uh, everybody. So, uh, if you have any question, you can uh, we can you can feel free to let me know, and I'm glad to discuss about that. Thank you. Cool. Um... Thanks uh, for the great presentation. It's really a very, very interesting problem. Um, so we have some uh, some questions from the uh, uh, audience. Um, oh, the first question is, how do we resolve the issue of uh, uh, conflicting uh, logical equations in the recommendations? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, this is a very good question. Yeah. So um, a good thing about uh, uh, um, let me return to this page. Actually, this is a um, an, an advantage of our proposed framework. So uh, to compare with previous um, hard rule-based logical reasoning, right? for example, by using the um, algorithmic solvers to solve hard rule uh, encoded uh, logical equations, these systems cannot uh, uh, correctly handle the um, the conflict of rules in the logical systems. So in this way, the system just cannot produce the correct answer. I mean, it just cannot uh, produce the answer, produce any answer for the input uh, logical equations because there are uh, conflicts. But uh, um, for this kind of uh, neural symbolic neurological learning system, right? Because we are learning the uh, vector embeddings uh, in a continuous system, right? So in this way, we do not, we, even though there would be some uh, uh, conflicting rules in the, uh, in the input logical equations, we can still uh, train this machine learning model and learn the, uh, learn the vector embeddings and uh, uh, neural uh, logical modules in this architecture so that we can still make predictions for the uh, for the users and uh, 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 personalized recommendations for the users. So, as a brief summary to the question, right? So, I mean, we allow the input uh, equations to uh, to 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 contain some conflicting rules, and it does not hurt the model to train the uh, vector embeddings and the neural modules in the system because basically this is a machine learning model, right? And we only guarantee that uh, the uh, in the guarantee that the correct uh, uh, products can be recommended with high probability, and this is guaranteed by uh, by the loss function, right? Because by using this loss function, we try to maximize the score of the positive products and minimize the score of the negative products to make recommendations. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, another question uh, from the audience. Uh, this is uh, from Tajeshwi. Um, so imagine we are uh, talking about a, a search engine, like a, a search engine for e-commerce, right? So for any search, uh, there's a possibility we return, you know, uh, a lot of results, uh, even uh, over hundred results, right? Yes. Uh, some just a simple match, some maybe related, or some maybe in uh, uh, other way, you know, uh, uh, returned uh, by the search engine because uh, uh, previously uh, people click on the results. 
So mm -hmm. uh, imagine this setting, what is the, what is your uh, approach? Like, you know, if we want to uh, come up with some, with some uh, recommendations of uh, experimental recommendations for these results. For, you mean for search results? Yeah, for, for search, results. search Okay, okay. Actually, uh, yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, uh, we have some papers, some research uh, on uh, explainable search, uh, but I didn't mention uh, because in this talk, we are mostly focusing on recommendation systems. So I didn't talk too much about the search uh, systems. So basically in my view, um, search and the recommendation are, is that they are different, but they are very similar to each other. So the difference is that uh, search systems are user uh, proactive. So users are going to post their queries and then we're going to provide search results for the users. And the recommendation are, I mean, are in recommended systems, users are mostly passive, passively receive the recommendations because we, I mean, we, the system actively uh, provided the recommendations. But the underlying model, if we go into the machine learning perspective, the underlying model could be uh, very similar. The key difference is that in search systems, we have the user's query, but in recommended systems, we do not have this explicit user query. So, uh, so because of this, I mean, many uh, personalized explainable recommendation algorithms can be easily adapted to search systems by uh, taking the user's uh, query as an extra input to the model so that the guarantee that the, uh, the, 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 the produced uh, recommendation results are closely related to the, uh, to the user's uh, query. For example, a very naive solution would be that just to run a recommendation model first and then we can do some filtering uh, to select the products that are related to the uh, user query. But this is, of course, this is a very uh, naive solution. We can do it more, uh, more carefully, more, uh, um, more wisely, right? By, for example, in, in, in this kind of, uh, um, in this kind of uh, generation model, right? For example, we can put the uh, user query as the as part of the input to the generation gener generation model, so that we can uh, guarantee that the generated explanations are related to the user query, and the user will feel that the explanation is relevant um, to what I'm asking, right? Rather than uh, something that irrelevant. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, this is uh, uh, how these two uh, perspectives are related. Cool. Uh, I have a question about you know uh, uh, this uh, uh, natural language uh, explanations uh, that you generate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you are conditioned um, basically two things. One is like a sentimental score, and uh, the other thing is like uh, you know what this uh, uh, explanation is about. Like uh, for example, here yeah. it's about a room or about the you know tub or about the uh, airport, right? Yes, so that's right. Uh, are you saying you know the explanation is anything about the room that is uh, negative or positive, uh, but we don't really know, you know, uh, have control like uh, what this, uh, the context is or what is this uh, explanation is really about? Uh, what are these explanations really about? You mean, you mean, uh... What features to talk about? I didn't quite quite understand the last right. part of so this. For example, uh, since you are conditioned on two things, right? One is the feature and the rating. So is this natural language explanation is going to about like to be about like a, a neg negative uh, explanation about the uh, room, right? But in which way uh, it is you know negative? Uh, this is not really the system can control. Uh, in which way, uh, okay, so, um, so actually uh, the model <clears throat> first have these parts, right? This is a very traditional uh, recommendation part. We can use mm -hmm. any model to, to, to for, for this part. For example, it's just a very simple neural network where we have the user atom and we are going to predict some kind of uh, score. Usually um, um, any recommendation model would, have, would have finally produce some kind of score right, to rank the uh, products. <clears throat> from high to low. So this score uh, tell us if the system is going to, I mean, if the system would like to recommend or disrecommend uh, something. So this is uh, what, I mean, this is the sentiment 
that we want to uh, that we want to uh, control in our uh, final explanation. So I mean, um, um, so so I mean that uh, <clears throat> the sentiment of the uh, explanation means, I mean, it's not really about uh, the quality of the of the um, of the product on, on on some some kind of perspectives. It only uh, corresponds to our, I mean, by our, I'm seeing the system, the system's belief if uh, the user should buy something. Maybe the system could be wrong, or right? maybe this product is a good match uh, for the user. But anyway, our system still thinks that it's, a, it's, it's a not a good choice for the, for, the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the user. But as long as our system believes it is or it's not a good choice for the user, we hope that the explanation should be consistent with our system's belief of uh, um, whether this the user should buy or not buy uh, the product. Um, so I mean, as a um, 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 I mean a, a, a brief answer to the question. So the sentiment uh, does not mean the quality of the. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> does not mean the quality of the product uh, on the on these particular features, but it represents um, our system's belief that if or not the user should buy this product. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I will take another question. Uh, so uh, when you use neurological expre uh, expressions to related uh, products, uh, how do you choose the logical structure of the expressions to check? Uh, do they emerge in a natural way? So, so basically the question is like, where these uh, logic expre uh, expressions come from? Okay, okay. <clears throat> So very good question. So for time seeing, I didn't uh, uh, really talk too much details about this part. So this is how do we construct the uh, logical expressions? For example, um, for example, we have a user, right? And we know that the user, uh, the user purchased the atom of V three after uh, some historical historical interactions. For example, which means that the user purchased the V one and the V two first, and then the user purchased the V three, right? And we know that the users, the user likes V1 and dislikes uh, uh, V2, right? So then we can build a training example for this user in this way. This, I mean, that we, we assume that the reason that the user purchased atom of V3 could be three reasons, right? Either that the user um, likes uh, V1 and the V1 and the V3 is uh, our, our complement, or that the user dislikes uh, uh, v2 and the v2 and the v3 are substitutive, or that uh, uh, both of the two uh, historical behaviors are related to v3, which means that v1 and not v2 would be uh, positively related to uh, v3. Right? So um, these, the first two parts are called the first order uh, relationships, and the second part are the third part is a second order relationship because we try to model. The relationship between v3 and uh, v1 v2 together right we can even add a higher order uh, relationships uh, if the user have more but uh, in our practical application practical ex experiments we find that the two orders are already sufficient enough to to make a good recommendations and uh, if the order is too high then the, the computational time would be too much and uh, it doesn't worth it to to further um, to further increase the uh, order of the model which is very similar to factorization machines, right? Uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, these kind of uh, models. <clears throat> so in this way, for each user, uh, we can build this uh, equation. And uh, for, so for example, if we have 1,000 users, then we're going to have 1,000 uh, equations. And we're going to run the model on these 1,000 equations to, to learn the uh, variable embeddings and the logical modules. And then, <clears throat> uh, then based on this, the results, we can provide recommendations for, for, for new users. Yeah. Okay. So this cool. is how do we, yeah, how do we construct the equations? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we'll take another question. Uh, can you expand uh, a little bit more uh, about, you know, template based uh, versus like a BERT or other language model uh, based uh, approach yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, generating yeah, explanations? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is a, a very important perspective. I think I think this is a very important perspective. So, um, so um, 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 I mean, a lot of the recent uh, uh, sentence generation models are uh, 
for example, um, free text sentence generation models, uh, beginning from uh, sequence to sequence models a few years ago, right? Like RN, RSTM, right? <clears throat> um, GRU, some models like this, to, 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 to more recent uh, pre trained language models like uh, uh, BERT and the GPT models. So these models are highly flexible, but they are less controllable. Okay. I mean, a lot of researchers are trying to solve the problem. I mean, it, controllability is a big, is, 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 is not a fatal uh, problem of these models. We can solve the problem. I just mean that we need to solve the problem uh, in the future, uh, the controllability problem. So for um, template-based template, template -based, uh, uh, sentence generation models, right? So usually we can manually define some templates for a domain perspective, domain specific templates. For example, in, in, in our explanation uh, perspective, uh, explanation uh, problem, we can define this template, right? This template shows that we see that size that we recommend something because the product is good on some feature. Okay, this is a template. The only thing we need to do is to decide what feature that we need to put into this template uh, to create an explanation. So these kind of uh, uh, explanations are highly controllable, right? You, we, can, we can define uh, a lot of templates. For example, another template could be that uh, this product and uh, that product are frequently co-purchased with each other, right? So, 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 so you only need to uh, decide what two products to put into this template uh, to generate this explanation. So this kind of uh, explanation is, is very controllable, but the problem is that it's, it's less flexible. So if we always show this kind of explanations, users may feel boring because users may feel that I mean, the system is not intelligent enough, right? So uh, if we can really bridge these two parts, okay, <clears throat> to make the model both highly controllable and um, how if it's flexible in terms of the language pattern, then this kind of greatly uh, improve the experience of the users and uh, uh, to make the system, uh, I mean, looks more um, intelligent uh, to the users. <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, at 11 o'clock exactly. So uh, this yeah. concludes our uh, 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 seminar. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this very exciting, very interesting, uh, you know, presentation. Uh, and uh, we will also like to uh, uh, invite uh, all the, uh, you know, uh, audience uh, to check out our uh, future uh, uh, speaker series. Uh, the uh, presentation and also uh, the slides will be made available. Uh, you will get emails uh, from us. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Hanshin. Thank you very much. Everyone, bye.